And I will hand over to Helge Giese, who kindly volunteered to introduce our speakers today. Thank you so much, Helge. You're quite welcome. So uh, I'm, I have the honor to introduce to you uh, Wataru Toyukawa and um, <clears throat> uh, Brendan Barrett. Um, so Wataru um, uh, has been working uh, for me for the uh, and with the group of Wolfgang Geismer um, from 2019. Uh, before that, he did a postdoc in uh, University of St. Andrews, Scotland, and did his PhD in Hokkaido uh, University, Japan. Uh, he's uh, doing uh, human social learning uh, experiments in online groups and also interested in the computational underpinnings of it. And uh, then, uh, yeah, I, I guess he will tell you more about his current research. The same is true for Brendan Barrett, who uh, did his PhD in animal behavior at the University of California, Davis, and uh, now a postdoctoral research fellow at the Max Planck Institute um, in Adolf Zell. So, and he, he's, uh, interested in similar ideas just from an animal perspective i would think so he's interested in in the uh, social learning strategies and individual behavior uh, that shape population level cultural dynamics um, and i guess they also share some methods so i'm interested to to see uh how they um yeah what uh, uh they come up with for today so I guess Bataru starts. Yeah, thank you so much, Helge, uh, for kind of introduction. So let me share my screen. So welcome to the, our joint session uh, about understanding combined decision making and cultural transmissions through uh, reinforcement learning framework. So this is a part one of the joint session. And so today I'm gonna talk about um, about human combined decision making and collective um, intelligence and harding behavior. Uh, while Brendan will later present uh, cultural transmission dynamics in what mainly in wild primate. So um, although our topic might seem uh, fairly distinct, um, but we both use the same computational modeling approach. So in this joint session, we'd like to show, showcase uh, um, how such reinforcement learning modeling can help us connect theory and empirical data very well. So, okay, let's get started. Right, so uh, I've been interested in uh, collective uh, decision-making in general, um, but basically uh, on the combined uh, process of decision making. So here, uh, social learning promote, can promote collective intelligence in various group living animals. Um, for example, you know, um, collective foraging by honeybees or um, house hunting or homing of, of pigeons and also uh, group decisions by humans as well. The, the simplest account of such collective intelligence has been a simple noise cancellation process, sometimes called the wisdom of crowds or the many wrongs principle. So which stands on the very static view of information aggregation. But many recent studies of animal collective intelligence have, have suggested such improved combined decision performance cannot be uh, fully accounted by a mere noise cancellation process but rather it is more, more dynamic, non-linear interaction that should underlie collective intelligence. So to understand how then animals can benefit from combined repeated decision-making processes, I'd like to focus here on collective learning um, situations where animals make decisions and then receive new experience associated with this uh, decision making. Then this experience updates their knowledge and so on and so on. So this is a repeated recursive process between um, decision making and 
reward-based learning. So in such a situation, social interaction may be able to improve learning and future decision-making, which will then further improve the future quality of social information. So this uh, interactive you process uh, will be potentially uh, um, improve the um, combined decision performance. So the question is, what kind of formal modeling is useful here? To tackle this, I've been using reinforcement learning models or simply RL. So RL uh, is one of the fundamental theoretical framework mainly massively used in machine learning or robotics um, like, like AI agent playing an um, Atari game, for example. Um, but RL has been also uh, widely used in uh, area of behavioral science, such as um, economics, uh, psychology, and neuroscience, and also uh, biology as well, behavioral ecology or evolutionary biology too. So what is RL? So, and how is it used in behavioral science in particular? So in behavioral science, reinforcement learning is used to model decision-making process, uh, especially when animals have to find a right balance between information exploration versus um, knowledge exploitation. So, okay, here, please imagine uh, one farmer here facing a question, which potatoes or wheat he should plant for this uh, coming season. But pr problem is he doesn't know which option, which potatoes or wheat is better option, better to uh, plant. So let's assume that he's just try to plant potatoes for this season and get some yield. Um, but unfortunately the potato uh, crop uh, result in the poor a poor yield than he originally expected, which is sad, but uh, this experience will update his belief, uh, which could inform the, uh, his new uh, decision making. So based on this experience, he's now uh, updated the belief about the potatoes productivity. And now he believes that maybe wheat is much better option. So then he make a decision, uh, he choose wheat here and then get, some, get the new uh, yield. And then this new experience will further inform um, his uh, belief uh, further, which will then uh, inform the, his next choice as well. So this is a, again, recursive process between um, decision-making and reward-based knowledge update. So reinforcement learning is, is a model which is trying to capture this uh, recursive process. So in behavior science, reinforcement learning is used as a kind of a statistical model, um, which is uh, uh, in, in the family of the hidden Markov process model in particular. Um, so in reinforcement, using reinforcement learning model, they, uh, we want to try to um, estimate uh, what we cannot directly observe. So the internal process underlying these um, observable behavioral data. So reinforcement learning is, could be one of the possible uh, mechanism which potentially uh, be able to describe uh, this hidden process. And so once we, once we model such a model, then we can infer, uh, estimate the most likely model parameters and model structures using statistical estimation. So this is what uh, uh, behavioral scientists normally want to do uh, using reinforcement learning model. So the first step of the reinforcement learning, the simplest RL model is a value updating. So suppose that the farmer has an attraction score for each of the crops. So attraction score or like a, a value for each uh, potatoes and wheat, then Suppose that this farmer chose the wheat in this case and get some reward. This experience is uh, then integrated to the attraction score by, um, by weighted parameter alpha. So alpha is called learning rate or 
memory parameter or simply a step size parameter depending on the discipline. But here I simply call this uh, learning rate. So the learning rate alpha is a free parameter which can which could vary individual to individual. So we can estimate this alpha value for each individual using a statistical method. But under the given alpha, then his, um, his attraction score will be updated. So this is a very updating process. Then the attraction scores should be mapped onto the choice probability. Here I used um, softmax function or multinomial logistic function, uh, which has another free parameter called beta. So beta controls the sensitivity to difference in attraction scores. So again, beta is a free parameter, uh, which we could uh, estimate the value for each individual. So the larger the beta, the choice is becoming more um, deterministic or choices becoming more preferring toward the uh, options that has a larger attraction score. But the smaller the beta, the choice is becoming more explorative, more random. Um, so the beta controls this behavioral um, exploration strategies. Right, so now we have a RL model through which we can study human decision-making strategies and individual differences through parameter estimation. So in an experimental task, participants were invited to the laboratory and they performed a two option choosing task like um, deciding potatoes or wheat, I, which I described before. And the participants could get some real monetary reward as an incentive, but um, However, they didn't know which option, which wheat or pota um, potatoes were good option at the beginning. So they had to gradually learn through their own experiments. In such experimental situations, human decision-making was very captured by the simple RL model. So as, you, as you can see here, the, the real human behavior was nicely predicted by a fitted, best fit model. And Using this approach, we can identify individual behavior variations uh, from the viewpoint of um, model parameters, differences in model parameters. All right, so, so far, my model has focused on the individual learning process only. So let me move on to the collective learning case where individuals are influencing each other. So how can we uh, combine social influence in this um, RL framework? Now I assume that the individual choice probability depends on both value updating softmax um, function and what others do. So these two processes are simply averaged by this social influence weight parameter a gamma value. So this is again, um, three parameters, which we can fit for each individual. So by statistically fit several possible candidate model and using Bayesian model estimation process, uh, model estimation, a uh, model selection method, we could estimate it the most likely behavior strategies deployed by each participant. So as this figure shows, some participants have um, were relying mainly on social learning, so depicted by orange, but the other uh, participants were more uh, have, uh, relying more on non-social reinforcement learning process. So as we, so here, uh, there are substantial individual differences and importantly, such differences could be statistically identified or quantified through model fitting method and model selection process. So, all right, so I've been talking about how reinforcement learning model can be used as a statistical method, statistical model to study individual level processes. But from now on, I'll be talking about how this RL framework can also be used um, to 
to study um, collective behavior through agent-based modeling, agent-based simulations. So to study collective behavior, I focused on a multiplayer version of the gambling task. So here, the, the options were slot machines rather than potatoes and wheat. So but the task itself is conceptually the same as before. So participants chosen, have to choose an option and get some reward. Then they can see social information about how many times each option was chosen by, chosen by other people in the same group. So this is essentially the collective learning task where multiple people are playing the same decision-making um, task. So using this frame, using this task, I, uh, we studied collective decision-making pattern through, um, through online game experiment. So where we recruited more than 700 people uh, for a participant. Here, we had a hypothesis about, uh, about the individual variations in social learning strategies. According to the evolutionary theory, we could expect that the larger the group size or the higher the uncertainty of the situation, the heavier social influence would uh, become because social learning is more uh, beneficial under such circumstances. And if so, the question is, can we predict a concomitant pattern of collective behavior dynamics through the uh, model fitting and simulations? So, to approach this, we manipulated both group size and task difficulties. By fitting the model results, so this is the model fitting result um, and showing that uh, dynamics, temporal dynamics of individual social influence parameters and individual um, conformity strength parameter. So this result suggests that people relied less on social learning when task was easy, while they relied heavily on social learning when tasks were more difficult. And what was fascinating for me particularly was that this individual level pattern could then nicely predict the collective level behavioral dynamics when I ran an agent-based simulation using the calibrated individual parameters. So I ran agent-based simulation, and then as a result, uh, this shows that in the easy task, thanks to the fact that individuals were not relying too much on copying, group dynamics can still retain its flexibility. But on the other hand, when task was difficult, because individuals were um, heavily de depending on others' behavior, collective behavior, uh, pattern was more prone to inflexible harding. So in sum, the, our results suggest that RL can naturally connect the individual level um, strategy, individual level behavior, behavior and um, collective level patterns. So reinforcement learning is a, is a useful uh, framework which bridge together these two uh, layer of the phenomena. Right, so and uh, here's another example of the applicability of RL modeling. So here I have, um, I have recently applied the same RL model to study decision-making biases. So both in economics and psychology, behavior bias such as risk aversion has been an important concept. So these are very known a bias that when one of the behavior option is more uncertain, than others, so such as, uh, for example, when wheat is noisier than potatoes, for example, then reinforcement learning agent tend to choose potatoes, even though, you know, potatoes, uh, which is a safe option here. Uh, so potatoes expected yield is smaller than wheat. The question is, how does such bias affect combined decision patterns? Is the bias Father amplified further through uh, the copying process. To approach this, we ran an agent-based model simulation and found that 
collective learning can um, overcome, collective learners can overcome rather than amplify the potential, potentially unfavorable risk aversion bias, thanks to the self-organization process. But to fully understand what, what kind of self-organization process is operating, I, so we developed the um, um, approximate population level dynamic model uh, where we um, model the pattern of abstract pattern of aggregation of reinforcement learners. So to explore how this bias was overcome by conformity influences. The model analysis provide a whole picture of what happened in agent-based simulations. So for example, um, when the x-axis here in this figure, x-axis is zero, so which means when there's no social influence or um, pure individual learning uh, learners are playing, then population prefers the potatoes due to, you know, which is safer option because you know, of the risk aversion bias. But when social influence is positive and when conformity is not too large, the population can overcome the bias because thanks to the um, fact that social influence is still smaller than the potential individual bias. So because social influence is smaller than individual bias, then weighted sum of the, uh, these two terms result in uh, the per capita probability of potato smaller than the original individual bias. But, but when conformity is too large and social re uh, reliance on social learning is also large, then population will be regulated by uh, strong positive feedback, which leads to hardening phenomena. So overall, this result suggests that reinforcement learning model could be nicely connected to other modeling approach such as population dynamics. So in summary, the RL is basically a model of individual decision-making and learning processes. And we can identify individual behavior strategies and individual variations within the population, which is itself is very interesting and has important implications to behavioral science, including clinical applications such as um, computational psychiatry. However, what I've been um, fascinated mostly by this approach is its generality and applicability to collective behavior, as well as um, cultural transmission processes that Brenda will soon present in detail. So, and Simulations and theoretical in, um, investigation will then be informed by the individual parameter analysis. So these two um, approach will be well connected, uh, will be um, helping each other. And also the aggregation of reinforcement learning agents can be appro nicely approximated by the established population dynamics models. So which further allows us to integrate theory and behavior data uh, very well. So I'd like to apply this uh, approach to a wider range of collective behavior system in the future. All right, so then we, uh, next, next talk, we move on to the cultural transmission dynamics. All right, okay, so maybe we can move. Uh, so please, Brendan, uh, Mike is yours. Thanks, Victoria, thanks for the talk. Um... All right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brendan Barrett. I am a postdoc in the Department of Biology at the University of Constance, and also um, a researcher at the Department for the Ecology of Animal Societies at the MPI um, for Animal Behavior here in Constance as well. Today, I'm gonna to kind of talk about a lot of the similar issues that Wataru talked about, but coming from the perspective of an evolutionary ecologist and kind of how, how we kind of converge upon similar methods. So um, as an evolutionary biologist, we teach evolution, especially to undergrads or in high school, we are kind of taught that there's three ingredients to evolution. There's variation. We typically think of this as genetic variation um, in the population of different genotypes. There's heritability. We typically think about this as genetic heritability. Um, a genotype can be passed from a parent in the F1 generation to the offspring in the F2 generation. And then there's selection. It's some kind of variance trimming process that 
you know, winnows through the variation in the population. So we often think about this as natural selection, but it can also be um, other processes such as neutral processes, such as drift and small populations and hitchhiking and other things that aren't natural selection. But I think one of the things I wanna to talk to you guys today about is thinking about culture as a system of inheritance and how culture can evolve. So um, for the purposes of this talk, we'll define culture or behavioral traditions as variation typically in behavior that's acquired and maintained by social learning. And social learning is a mechanism through which these different um, behavioral phenotypes can be inherited. And this can occur rapidly within an organism's lifetime in contrast to genetic inheritance. And there's also different, different socially learned behaviors also may be differentially selected. This may occur via natural selection, via neutral processes such as um, drift, or also do the things called learning biases. So in cultural evolution, cognition can be an agent of selection. And one of the challenges of social learning is that as social animals, there's a wide variety of information in a population. There's many potential demonstrators from whom we may acquire social information, the utility of which some behaviors is kind of opaque. So one of the central um, focuses of cultural evolution is identifying different transmission biases or also known as social learning strategies. So social learning strategies are the psychological heuristics, um, rules of thrum, daumenregeln, that can act as shortcuts to, for an individual to efficiently reach an adaptive behavior. Um, a commonly talked about one is copying the majority, often talked about as conformist transmission or positive frequency dependent learning. Um, one may also copy the most efficient behavior. So the one that has the highest payoff is most successful on average overall across all observed um, individuals in a population. Or you might kind of copy some cue that has some proxy as correlates with this, or might be a good proxy for whom to copy. So in some contexts, one might want to learn from similar, older, or successful individuals in a population. And um, cultural evolution literature was developed by a bunch of population biologists. So it really was theoretical for much of the first 20 to 30 years of its lifetime. And it's specified as these recursive mathematical models that are kind of Popeye style models that specify how social evolution affects the probability of displaying a behavior. There's also a family of just modeling social information in this um, literature, but also modeling the co-evolution of genes and culture um, and social learning alongside each other. One of the things that I wanna kind of um, talk about today, I think is really important in kind of understanding the approaches that Wataru and I is, use is to move away from thinking about culture as a collection of behaviors of time and differences between and within groups, but to think about it as a dynamic process. It's a dynamic open system. And being an open system, um, it's subject to something called equifinality. So there's a picture of sea urchins here because Hans Dreisch, who was a German um, biologist, came up with this equipotentialität auf Deutsch, um, but equifin equifinality in English, this idea when he was doing experiments with a bunch of sea urchins, he could manipulate their cells a bunch of time early in development and have the potential to reach similar end states when he was doing all these developmental experiments um, with sea urchins. So another way to think about this is that more generally, the given end state or a steady state um, of a dynamic open system, it can be reached by many means. And this was popularized into systems theory, which I'm sure many people in this cluster are familiar with by the Hungarian um, biologist Ludwig van uh, Bertalenfi. That's correct pronunciation. And as it relates to cultural evolution and social learning, what this means is that different social learning strategies can take different pathways between identical initial and final conditions. It also means that multiple learning strategies can lead to the same endpoint in a dynamic system. So oftentimes in the field, when uh, study researchers of animal behavior were trying to study cultural traditions, they would look at a single cross section of um, behavior if they're observing monkeys, or other animals or look at um, the end point of the experiment and the beginning point and can compare them and make some kind of inference about how the, so the animal learned. But what kind of one of the things that's really important is that you need to look at the dynamics of behavior in a population to get at the different strategies and mechanisms that can lead to the signatures we see in the population. Um, but population level signatures can be misleading for the aforementioned reasons of often related to sampling designs of experiments, but they can also be really misleading about individual behavior. Um, they are really informative of what the population is doing, but they're not representative of all individuals in the population. And this is really concerning if individuals vary re regarding whom or when they observe an individual 
or if they vary in cognition, the social learning strategies they use um, or their reliance on individual versus social learning. So I think in terms of understanding social learning in different studies, there's a couple of caveats to think about when considering One is that the inference of social strategies from a single demonstrator or the observer in transmission chains can be problematic. So a classic paradigm in studying social learning was having a couple demonstrator and observer. And if you saw fidelity of a behavior along this transmission chain, you would conclude that the animal is social learning. And some, in some studies, they would conclude how they socially learn. But when you have a single demonstrator, you have no variation in information in the population. You only say that it's likely they socially learned. Um, in other studies, which is still slightly less problematic, but still a problem, is that if you're trying to make inferences about social learning strategies when there's behavioral fixity, this is really challenging. So if an individual monkey or other animal migrates into a population where they observe only one behavior and they switch their preference for that behavior, there are multiple mechanisms that could arise to them switching their behavior. You have good evidence that they learn, but because there's no variation in the population, um, copying a high ranking individual, copying the most common behavior, uh, copying you know, the most successful behavior, all of these will lead to the same outcome unless you have variation introduced into the population that's either standing or an innovation may arise endogenously. And also it, it suggests that inference of social learning strategies from population dynamics warrants caution. Um, they're not useless by any strict means of the imagination and they're really informative, but I think it just warrants a little bit of care and evaluation of um, alternative hypotheses. So I think, you know, equifinality is an unavoidable problem, but you can account for plausible in instances of this. I think it's really important to evaluate multiple plausible learning strategies that might give a rise to the patterns we see in data and in nature, but this has to be informed by the natural history or the sociological context of our study systems. I also think it's really important to simulate the hypothesized data generating mechanisms we have when we're studying cultural evolution, and also the sampling regime of our data design, um, of our experiments, of our observations, to see if and how hypotheses can be discerned. Um, there's a push for using dynamic statistical approaches, so these network-based diffusion analysis, um, experience-weighted attraction models, like which Haru talked about in IWIL, um, and also approximate Bayesian computation. And something I think is often ignored is do not remove uncommon behavioral variants. So sometimes looking at very, very rare things in a population can be more informative about the mechanisms that are used um, by particular animals. And there's a tendency, particularly in the animal literature, to, to drop cases when there's more than two potential behaviors to score. And as I talked about one way to account for um, equifinality or anticipate issues of it or better make inference about social learning is to model the behavioral dynamics. One method to do this that Wataro spoke about earlier in his experiments, and I'm gonna talk about are these things called experience weighted attraction models. So these are really originally developed in behavior, experimental behavioral economics literature um, to estimate the role of social learning and economic, normal form economic games. And one of the advantages of this is that it permits the evaluation of the influence of multiple plausible learning biases. So you can look at uh, different hypotheses and look for instances where different mechanisms will lead to the same signatures in individuals or populations. And one of the big advantages related to the topic of this talk is that it combines a dynamic reinforcement learning model, a risk of the Wagner learning rule with social learning biases. And I think this is really important for reasons that kind of jive with theory in cultural evolution. So a common, um, it's commonly thought that social learning evolves just because it saves the, the cost of individual learning. But theoretical modeling by Alan Rogers and others in the late 80s um, show that this isn't the case. And what actually makes social learning is this combination of individual learning and social learning. It's the integration of the two that raise population mean level fitness and can allow culture um, to evolve. And it's really nice to have kind of these theoretical models um, directly translate into statistical models and our theoretical models kind of match our intuitions and lessons we can learn from extant theory. And one of the other strengths of this approach um, is that you can build them up as multi-level models and this permits the evaluation of individual heterogeneity and cognition and its contribution to population level cultural dynamics. And it also closely links theoretical models to the statistical models we use to analyze data. Um, if you have a theoretical model that's mathematically specified of a social learning strategy, you can just turn that into a probabilistic statistical program uh, and fit that to your data to see if it 
you know, it predicts the patterns one observes. And I'll, I'll rush through this a little bit because Wataru covered this, but essentially what you can think about is that these models say the probability of an individual choosing a, be a particular behavior at a time step that's influenced by individual learning, individual reinforcement learning, as we're talking about today, and some type of social learning. And as we talked about, um, individuals can weigh the relative importance of individual versus social information. And any box in gray will be a parameter you estimate. Anything in yellow will be um, empirical data. So here we have the risk score of the Wagner um, reinforcement learning rule where we have these attraction scores, which is the time series model that estimates, um, has this memory parameter. So it's the relative importance of uh, recent experiences versus foregone experiences. Uh, Watara mentioned this is alpha in his talk. You have the payoff in individual uh, experiences with the behavior. And then these get transmitted into a multinomial, um, via multinomial softmax transformation into another probability for individual learning. And then you can combine that into have a social learning component where they have a mathematical model of social learning. In this case, it's positive frequency dependence or conformance transmission that Batara talked about. You can have this concave convex sandwich um, of individual and social learning that you'll fit to data. And to kind of give you an idea of an output of what one of these models look like, um, this is from a recent paper. You know, imagine, imagine a individual is flipping a coin at each time step. That's going to be the probability it is um, performing a behavior. And whether or not their behavior has a high payoff or is successful is going to influence is going to influence the likelihood of them choosing the behavior at a future time step. So these lines are kind of tracking the probability with each coin flip or die flip if it's more than two options, um, die roll. So it's a combination of their individual experience at that time step, their memory of past experiences of these three behavioral options, and the social information that they observe. So this is output from five different experience weighted attraction models. I'm looking at say three, four different social learning strategies, and then a global model of all of them, kind of showing the different behavioral trajectories that can be predicted um, for an individual, um, this in this case, a vervet monkey. Um, it attracts their successes and failures. Now I'll talk about kind of um, some of my dissertation work, which was building these statistical models into hierarchical models that could be fit and stand and some field experiments. So this um, experiment I'm gonna talk about focused on white-faced capuchin monkeys. They're a great system for studying social learning and cultural evolution because they have one of the largest recorded repertoires of behavioral traditions or cultural traditions in any animal, like mostly these bond testing rituals and games that they'll play, but also a lot of foraging traditions. They're really tolerant of close proximity of um, observant conspecifics while foraging. They'll tolerate a lot of observations pretty um, equally. Adults, juveniles, males, females, they're very tolerant for, for a primate with having others watch them closely. And they're ecological generalists. They're extremely reliant on extractive foraging and they're exceptionally dexterous. Their niche is kind of going through the forest, destroying everything and figuring out what they can eat to survive and just messing with the environment around them. So this work was done with um, Richard McElrath and Susan Perry, who manages a long-term capuchin field site. Um, it's been going on for 30 years called Lomas Vagdal in Northwest Costa Rica. And here I focused on one particular behavior. It was Panama processing. So Panama fruits are the structurally protected fruits and the techniques to open them differed between groups at this longitudinal field site we're monitoring 11 groups. So they're really ideal candidates as behavioral traditions. Uh, Panama processing generates really high levels of close range focused observation, the second highest in the diet only to wasp nests. And interestingly, these processing techniques differ in payoff, both in efficiency, you take two seconds to 45 minutes to successfully open a fruit and efficacy. They're not guaranteed to be able to successfully open these fruits um, avoid their structural defenses, the exudates, the gummy exudates, the stinging hairs, and just the hardness of the fruit to access these really delicious um, seeds on the inside. What I did was I took advantage of kind of the unique, an unique opportunity at this longitudinal field site where we had one group of capuchins called Flakes Group, which was the fission product of the original study group at Lomas. So they migrated from this intact tropical dry forest in blue to a fragmented riparian oak corridor that lacked Panama trees. So as it was a long-term field site and we knew where all the adults came from before this group fission and where they migrated from, we had five knowledgeable adults from different natal groups who differed in known processing techniques 
and then 20 inexperienced adults and juveniles who had no experience with Panama. So it kind of was a naturally seeded experiment that was by definition ecologically valid. So what we had to do was go around the forest, climb and walk under Panama trees and set up some quasi experiments. So we went out in the field, we collected fruits, hid them under a poncho, recorded if a monkey fruits, recorded one of the seven processing techniques that they used. So here's a bad technique done by a juvenile, three years old that never worked. Um, recorded the audience IDs in proximity, who they directed attention at or glanced. And importantly, we did multiple fru fruits at once. So they had choice of who to look at. So here's an adult male watching the alpha male chew a hole in the fruit. He wasn't very good at it actually. And here the alpha female is ignoring her adult male son while he's sitting in contact with her processing a Panama fruit for about three minutes. She ignored him and his infant brother watched. So one of the advantages of doing this in the wild with a natural study system is that they have a social network that's built on, you know, they live 40 years in the wild, they know each other. And that's really important for understanding how social, how behaviors are socially transmitted. So what I did was I fit nine statistical models, experience weighted attraction models. Um, one was a pure individual reinforcement learning model. We had a frequency dependent learning model, a payoff bias learning model, which is copying the highest um, mean payoff behavior. So the one that took the least amount of time and then a suite of others copying older individuals, copying similarly aged individuals, and then um, a global model, which was kind of a, a sandwich of all of them. And we compared the predictions from all the models and the fits and information criteria to see what best explained the data. And what we got was the best support for the global model. So here is just a plot of raw data. Um, each row is an individual monkey. Each dot in the shape of the color is one of unique to one of the seven behaviors they use to open up a fruit. And, what we, and then the oldest monkeys are at the top and born in 1992 and the youngest monkeys are at the bottom born in 2014. So we found in red that the most successful technique went from rarest to most common in the population. And we see that all individuals born after 2009 tried the most successful behavior and knowledgeable individuals switched behavior. And we kind of see around this 2009 year birth line, I think the youngest individuals just couldn't physically perform the most efficient behavior. So they had to use something else. And then that was plots of raw data, but here we can use um, predictions from the model to plot unique per individual acquisition curves. And this can give us kind of an idea of how um, payoff bias learning and uh, actually I'll get back to that slide. Um, so what we found is that the most successful behavior, something we dubbed canine scene, went from spread from this innovator who introduced it around uh, day 20. It's about a 25 year old adult male. Um, and it spread to the group to this, these younger individuals. And this was kind of a technique that was akin to like shucking an oyster if you've ever done that. It worked much quicker than the other methods. And what we found from the model is that payoff bias learning had the biggest contribution in predicting behavior. So they copy the behaviors that are most successful on average, but we also got support for negative frequency dependent learning and age bias learning. So there's a certain degree of equifinality. And this makes sense because the high payoff behavior was initially rarest in the population when it got introduced by um, Napoleon, that adult male, I showed you the photo of in the beginning. And also older individuals were just better at processing fruits because they were bigger and stronger. So there's a degree of equifinality, but overall we see as an individual learning strategy that we got the most support for payoff bias learning. But we can't necessarily exclude all of these um, as, as mutually, they're not mutually exclusive. One of the things we can look at is the individual variation of different learning parameters in this model. So we see um, that social information predicts more behavior more strongly for um, younger individuals. So older individuals are less likely to pay attention to social information. And each of these dots is a unique monkey. And that younger individuals are influenced more by recent experience than older individuals. And this is a parameter from the reinforcement learning component of the model. So this suggests that younger individuals are more likely to switch and change behaviors while older individuals are more influenced by distant past memories of Panama processing. And to give you an idea of kind of what the output of some of this model looks here, we can plot predictions from the model um, average to the one of the 74 experimental days across 15,000 fruit, about 15,000, 1500 fruits. You can see around day 20, the model predicts the spread of this high payoff behavior in red, the quickest behavior and most successful on average. 
And here around day 19, we get to see the first introduction in the population by this individual Napoleon. And then after this, you can see this individual MX, he was a um, naive individual who picked this behavior up really quickly and kind of ran with and became one of the quickest in the population, um, if not the quickest after picking this up around day 25, 30. And then here, Mead, this individual on the bottom panel, she's a knowledgeable adult from another group who switched behaviors to the highest payoff behavior um, with a kind of you know, intermediate trial of an old behavior uh, around day 50. But one of the important things about this is that some adult individuals explored the most efficient technique. They tried the novel behavior, but they primarily used what was most successful for them. And this is consistent with social learning guiding the exploration of the strategy space and guiding the exploration of behavior, but individual learning being important for what they settle on as their primary behavior. So it's the integration of the two. I think another important take home of is this, is that inference at the individual level shows really considerable variation. Um, no individual actually represents what the population is doing at whole. Um, they have different, you know, latencies to display a behavior in a while, and some will produce different behaviors at different frequencies. And the population level dynamics do not reflect all these individuals, and they may have inferential limits, um, a point really driven home by my colleague Anna Kamler as well. And just give you kind of a quick other look at some other um, use of these experience weighted attraction models that acquire reinforcement learning. As we can see that vervet monkeys will also socially learn an extractive foraging task. Um, and they'll do this via a combination of payoff and rank bias learning. So unlike capuchins, where we didn't find evidence for this, um, vervets will bias attention towards acquiring the behavior of higher ranked individuals. Um, on the left, you can see you know, predictions at the population level of how the you know, mean, mean level population signature matches the raw data. And I'll go into individual plots in a minute, like the ones I showed you earlier. But if you look at predictors of state variables of individuals, we see that payoff cues are more important for females and juveniles, and rank cues are more important for females and adults. So we see some sex and age bias differences. And again, to drive home this point, um, there's a lot of individual heterogeneity in the time series of behavior, and we need to map that in addition to population level dynamics. So um, I'm gonna skip ahead to the last slide. And I think kind of some future directions from this research is that we really need to better explore the integration of individual reinforcement learning and social learning. Um, there's a lot of subtlety in how animals integrate these two types of behaviors that can lead to some counterintuitive outcomes as, um, as Lucy Applin's found in some of her work with great tits using similar models. We also need to better understand what structures individual heterogeneity in information use, both um, within and across time scales and its effect on collective behavior. So um, in work done by, you know, if we look at the capuchin research and the vervet research and also other work done by Lucy and colleagues is that we see this kind of, you know, in juvenile individuals, we see a higher reliance on social information and also a flexibility to socially learn. And the heterogeneity of how an animal learns in the population is really important for what's going to go on at the population level. And this is kind of really subtle combinations of parameters that can lead to really counterintuitive outcomes um, like rare behaviors becoming the most common behaviors in the population via the integration of conformist transmission and reinforcement learning. And I also think these age level signatures, um, we really need theoretical models of learning in both stage and age structured populations to kind of better understand why we see changes in social learning over the lifetime of an individual and also in reinforcement learning. And I think you know a big contribution to inference would be translating these uh, these um, discrete time experience weighted attraction models to um, continuous time models. And they would be a lot better suited to analyzing observational data with gaps in it. And with that, uh, I think Wataru and I will take any questions you may have. Yeah, Kaz? Hey, a uh, really interesting talk by, by both of you. Thanks for that. Um, I'm also, a, I guess, I don't know if you would classify yourselves as theoreticians, but I'm also a theoretician. And so I really like the approach, which to me, uh, which is kind of ignorant about the field, seems like uh, the most basic kind of minimal model of how to do this in a, you know, at least plausibly realistic way. And I'm, I'm curious if you think for the field experiments, um, how much data would you need to get to verify that maybe on some real level, this is what's happening? Or is it rather that you don't, 
you you don't think that this is a, a, a real model of the real process. You're just trying to get guidance on what to look for uh, to make these kind of age structured or, or sex biases. I'm just trying to uh, figure out from your perspective kind of where this model fits in uh, to kind of a mechanistic understanding. Do you have anything, Wataru? Um, yeah, for the, the data point, um, basically it's, it, it depends on the, the, the how complex the model is, and normally we do uh, before before data collection we can do um, simulation. We we can run simulation fast and then try to uh, see how our model fitting process can uh, reliably recover uh, the uh, the parameters and model structure we assumed in the simulation, and so we can. Through this process, we can roughly estimate what, how uh, the size of the uh, data point we need. But it's still, you know, it, it cannot fully guarantee that you can reliably estimate what is really going on in the inside of the brain or underlying uh, the process. So maybe this also re relates to the, your second point, like uh, how how reinfor reinforcement learning is can be realistic. Um, I mean, also it depends. For example, uh, in human study, our error model can be used as a, as a really uh, process model of the brain computation. In such case, for example, um, uh, the learning rate or exploration, exploitation parameter can be uh, associated with the uh, dopamine, for example, dopamine uh, activity function. And so in that case, reinforcement learning they use reinforcement learning as a as a mechanism model, but um, maybe uh, me and also Brendan's approach we uh, we don't always necessarily assume that this is really a mechanism of the uh, the behavior. But we can, yeah. So, uh, but still, I think it still uh, nicely captures some logical step or computational step necessary. Uh, uh, which might be underlying this observable data. Um, but yeah, if, if you, uh, Brendan has another point, um, you can free, free, free to add. Yeah, I think like the nice thing about using, as I was saying, like using a theoretical model and translating it to a statistical model and being explicit about the mechanisms is there's less hand waving, it's easier to communicate and you're up front. This is what we're looking for. And this is, you know, these are the caveats with that. On the note of, you know, I strongly second Bataro, it's like, especially before going into the field in these very costly or dangerous, you know, costly <laughs> experiments, um, is simulate data. Like you have, an, you have a hypothesized mechanism of the data generating process. It might be an abstraction, it might be wrong, but we're all wrong. We still learn from being wrong and building upon that. And, you know, simulate based upon your sample size, either how much you can afford or how much you're constrained in based on reality, simulate a variety of informational conditions because even because things can be really sensitive to kind of that aspect of to it that the animals or organisms may or may not surprise you with and then kind of simulate the time series and then add a bunch of wiggle room because your field assistant will not tell you that their recorder broke for two weeks and never reply to you again. Um, and you just have to have wiggle room for all this stuff but you know, I think being explicit about stuff with a simple model that lacks nuance is a better starting ground than ignoring the complexities of things. Great, cool, thanks a lot. And yet the second part, which I'll follow up with real quick. I think part of it is like, you know, we can look at these models, like I mentioned all of this age stuff and we see these consistent patterns and this could be like, you know, do we see this? Can we start a model? Can we have a counterfactual model where we're seeing if this age is actually important um, or if it might just be kind of a byproduct of the modeling artifact? So for example, if you're not careful in analyses with these models, um, if you have fewer sample sizes <laughs> of older individuals the post, and you're not looking at the full posterior, the posterior mean will be higher because there's more uncertainty here at this lower bound of zero. And you can get these spurious signatures that are just statistical artifacts. But with the age-related stuff, there's a lot of speculation verbally in the literature that can kind of inform the theoretical models and have us do these counterfactuals. And I think just 
looking at patterns we see from statistical analysis can have us do the experiments in our computers that we can't do in real life. So we have another question from Jakob. Hey, thanks for the interesting talks. Uh, a question for Wataru. I, I think I missed this in your talk or maybe I missed the details. I, you, you said that on a difficult task, there was more dependence on social information. Right. I'm wondering if that, how, how does that, how did that come about? Is there, are you taking into account confidence, such something such as confidence weightings in mm -hmm. the experiments or in the model? So that would be like, if there's less confidence in your decision, then you put more weight on the social and less on the individual or so on? Or could you yeah, say yeah, a bit yeah. more about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I was a bit unclear about that in my talk. Um, so in that experiment, I, uh, I had uh, two or three different between individual conditions. So, uh, and the conditions are related to the task um, difficulties or task uncertainty. Um, so in the easy task, uh, the slot machines can be easily um, differentiated because the noise level is very small. So you can easily get which option is better. But in the harder task, uh, the noise is, uh, the, the width of the noise is high, uh, larger than the easier one. So individuals have to uh, collect more information to differentiate the uh, goodness of the each option. So the difficult task means just uh, the noisy task, I'd say. And so I, I so when so when people are playing such a noisier task, um, so a participant playing the noisier task had uh, had higher reliance on conformity by social learning. So, so we, so I didn't um, computationally um, differentiate the uncertainty level, um, but we, uh, but by my previous study, I actually do that. Um, so during the course of the learning, sometimes, um, sometimes individuals get confused, right? By, uh, because two options has been producing very similar um, similar payoff thus far. So in that case, um, kind of the similarity of two attraction score is very, uh, uh, get, might, this might get confu confusing, you know, of the learning agent. So, uh, so we could easily implement this um, confidence level to uh, using social information, uh, social learning. Um, but yeah, so this, so the, the RL model I showed here today is the most simplest, uh, simplest version of it. So we can easily possibly extend more complex computation, I think. Um, yeah. Is that yeah. clear? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That, that, that makes more sense. Like, mm -hmm. Meg? Um, I had a question about the sort of I guess they're not really onto genetic trajectories, but these age-based differences that you saw, found in, in strategies, Brendan. And you had attributed that um, to size differences, but it, it just got me thinking about some recent work that's showing sort of ontogenetic differences, like sort of, yeah, in, in how much weight indiv human individuals give to good outcomes versus bad outcomes and sort of ways in which these valence asymmetries can change the way reinforcement learning works at the individual level. And I guess I was curious, like whether you think there are, is, is there any evidence for sort of ontogenetic trajectories in sort of the weightings of outcomes that might influence how social learning works as well? So I think if we translate that into the language that Wataru and I would use, would that be this, this parameter that multi gets multiplied by the attraction score? So the sensitivities to differences and payoffs? I'm trying to think of that would be that. So like if something has a really bad, if something has, if there's a difference in payoff, whether it's, if it's a good or a bad thing, you know, in these models, there's a parameter that says the sensitivity to the magnitude of that difference. So early in development, individual may be more or less sensitive to the magnitude between two differences. Does that kind of align with that, what you're saying? We can maybe talk about it later, but yeah. I, mean, I think like my understanding of, it's, it's my understanding of what this woman Kate Hartley showed was that in adolescence, adolescents are weighing 
negative, sort of basically prediction errors that resulted in sort of you getting less than you thought you were gonna get. So sort of these, these, these negative um, outcomes more heavily and it changed, it basically pushed them away from making kind of risky decisions in their social learning models. Yeah, that makes sense. That matches up with kind of Annie Vertz's work on a version of plants in children, I think, too. Like why kids hate <laughs> colored and shaped plants. Um, yeah, I think I think there's some overlap with that. And that seems like something that you could throw, just throw some more parameters in the right hand side. And I was just going to say, I was going to look up Lucy's paper. I had to skip over that slide because I forgot off the top of my head. But they saw a decline in the sensitivity over aging birds and this parameter that um, I was talking about. Um, but I think we see that, and I think, I don't remember if I saw that in vervet monkeys or not, but we do see that kind of decline in Lucy's work, which the forgotten slide. Do you have anything with Haru? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Um, so we can, so the, yeah, the, using the parameter, and parameter is not really always um, fixed uh, to to the individual. Um, and in in both time scale, like uh, during the very short behavioral task, uh, the learning rate parameters or exploration parameters could be uh, could be changing depending on uh, like uh, like how uncertain in this current situation is or how uh, so whether the participant is still very naive to this task or they gradually getting familiar with this task. And also uh, this parameter could also change during the course of uh, more biological development as well. So, uh, so we don't see uh, some, so maybe the reinforcement learning parameter, if, if this represents some uh, dopamine generic um, circuit or, um, but still, uh, this could be very plastic and um, this can be changing um, depending on the situation and course of the development. Um, so it's it's very risky to say when you see the snapshot of the individual differences, but we don't know yet whether this difference is fixed uh, in this population or this is just a, just a snapshot of um, more dynamic changing um, population. And I think like relative to the snapshot, I think Votar was talking about where you had the cross section. You know, if you do a cross section at one time stamp and you're trying to make inferences about age, you know, from all the different age individuals, I think with some of these learning parameters, we do see changes over time in unpublished work that I have. Um, but I couldn't look at the parameter that Lucy saw because it wasn't actually a reinforcement learning model. There wasn't differences in payoffs. It was just a dynamic learning model. So there's another point raised by Lucy. So if you, do, do you want to elaborate this more or? No, no, I was just saying that um, we see similar results to what you're getting, which is really nice that it seems to hold across species, um, particularly, well, in both tits and sparrows. There's, I'm working with someone at the moment in Arnhem Lotion in Israel who's testing this idea on um, sparrows and sees a very clear relationship between increasing task difficulty and the alliance of so on social learning. So it's nice. Yeah, 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 indeed. And actually, so I, I didn't have enough time to uh, explain detail of my, uh, the second part of my uh, recent task. And I hear that I, so one of the conundrum in conformity based reinforcement learning model is that so the, in theory, theory has suggested that the conformity bias normally you know, fix the population uh, due to the conformity behavior is going to be more inflexible. But in reality, or in when, when you use conformity bias uh, in reinforcement learning model, population is not really fixed, even though there's a strong conformity bias is operating. And so the one mechanism is that the assumption of the combination of reinforcement learning and conformity bias. So if the reinforcement learning part is really strong, then seemingly strong conformity bias could be still um, relaxing this reinforcement learning um, 
inflexibility, so to say. So, uh, so the, the we we do a weighted average. We're averaging of these two processes. So, this could be um, a kind of a source of in counterintuitive flexibility emerging in the population level. But yeah, I, um, I really uh, love to see the similarity between human uh, systems and other animal um, collective tra um, cultural transmission dynamics. I think maybe that then that's it for this joint session. Do, do you want to add, add anything, Brendan? I'm going to talk to you about this, Wataru, at some point, but yeah. if there's anyone in the department who might have a vague interest in uh, recycling behaviors, I have this experiment I've been wanting to do about glass recycling that's related to what Wataru has talked about and the, the boundary condition of the green-brown glass and recycling in Germany. Um, but if you're interested in such things, send me a message. <laughs>